You know, we see our, our hierarchy giving our Lord the Judas kiss by giving him over sacrilegiously to people who are in public mortal sin. And it's still going on. Father Jeff Fashing, a priest of 26 years, known for his unwavering preaching of authentic Orthodox Catholicism. Our topic today, judgment on impenitent bishops. Uh, Father Fashing, go ahead and take it away. The following content, I don't say really with any pleasure, and I don't just throw it out there without the evidence, so I'm going to get right into that. But when we talk about our Catholic hierarchy, the reality is that they are a group of men, and obviously not every last one, but as a group, they are modernist, actually Marxist, communists. Why do I say that? Well, there are these culture wars that we're aware of, most of us in the United States. And we could actually argue that they really began first in the Catholic Church. So we had these Marxist notions and applications, if you will, of socialism that begin to take root alongside all these theological errors that were going on or being taught or spread throughout the church. So for example, in the beginning of the last century when Joseph Stalin took over in the Soviet Union, he came to power, he took direct aim first and foremost at the Catholic Church. And he set out with this campaign first and foremost to destabilize her. So what did we have? You know, we had liberation theology from the Soviets. And this infected South America. There was this attempt to dissuade the dominant Catholic influence, in fact, throughout that entire continent. The same thing happened here in the United States. So Marxist philosophy actually spread throughout the United States Catholic Church from like the 30s to the 50s. So this brought in, in the Catholic Church in America, this coalition, if you will, intent not just on destabilizing the church, but the country as well. And we're seeing the fruits of that now. Hence, we have the likes of what? Joe Biden, John Kerry, Nancy Pelosi, the Kennedys, Dick Durbin, the list goes on and on and on. We also have Catholic universities that were invaded and overtaken by Marxist ideology. Okay, Barack Hussein Obama, he learned his Marxist skills from what? The playbook of Saul Alinsky, who teamed up with the Catholic Church in Chicago in the 30s and 40s and began this entire campaign of so-called what? Community organizing. That's all Barack Obama was. And it was all under this guise of Catholic training and quote unquote social justice, right? So we had these seminars began by Alinsky from where Barack Obama got his training and who funded those? Who funded his training? None other than the Archdiocese of Chicago. So we have this entire invasion of Marxism in the US church. And it was done under this phony guise of social justice. And so from when it began in like 1969, it fit in perfectly with the agenda of the Democratic Party, which made the same appeal politically about justice that corrupt Catholic leaders were making theologically. And so if you take that in conjunction with the efforts of the US bishops and this historic alliance between what? Catholic immigrants and Democrats, there is this machine, this powerful machine created to change the course of our great nation. And church leaders were sanctioning this democratic agenda and democratic leaders, many of whom were quote unquote Catholic and so the church leaders were giving their blessing to these democratic leaders from the church to advance their plans and they were in alliance with them. And that's what we see today. So what we have is this historic cooperation between church and state when there's supposed to be separation from church and state. But in this case, it was the particular part of the state, the democratic party, whose agenda has been almost entirely embraced by the U.S. hierarchy, and that's my point. And that's why Father Altman got canceled. That's what really put him off, you know, set him over the edge, if you will, when he gave his famous talk on you can't be Catholic and Democrat. And so then you had Roe v. Wade in 1973, and of course, the bishops, the 
Marxist bishops, if you will. Yes, they said abortion was wrong, but it was very quietly, you know, just to appease. And I don't even like saying this, but conservative Catholics, because you can't put political labels on Catholics. You're not conservative or liberal. You're either Catholic or you're not. You either embrace the faith completely and believe in it and practice it, or you don't. There's no liberal and conservative, okay? But they wanted to appease who they saw as conservative Catholics. So they never really did anything substantial to fight abortion, and I don't believe to this day they do either. And Jim, you probably agree with me on that. So not only did they refuse to follow the churches, if you go to the, the Canon 915, right? That big issue? Deny Holy Communion to pro-abort Catholic politicians, but they also have to this day, never once, in all these appeals for collections and money, ever taken up a pro-life collection. So the U.S. church establish, establishment is in this neck and neck race with actually the other party, the Republican Party. They want to, it seems like, see who can talk the biggest talk without actually doing anything about it, which brings me, I mean, because it's the preeminent issue and there are so many others and we've addressed many of them on this show, we don't need to get into them, but we definitely want to address abortion because it's at the top along with, you know, our Lord Jesus Christ's presence in the Blessed Sacrament. They're, they're both at the top. You know, we see our, our, our hierarchy giving uh, our Lord the Judas kiss by giving him over sacrilegiously to people who are in public mortal sin. And it's still going on. So if we can just, you know, take those two as reason enough to talk about why so many bishops and even clergy are running the risk of losing their very souls. Not that these sins are too big to be forgiven. I want to be clear. God can forgive any sin, no matter how great. I'm talking about the fact that they're persistent and obstinate and embracing grievous sin. And just, let's take the Eucharist. You know, that's God's greatest gift to us, the Holy Eucharist, Jesus Christ's presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. And God couldn't have given us a greater gift. If he could have, he would have done it. And yet we see how he's treated by our leaders, by the very ones who are supposed to defend his sanctity and his presence. Okay? But it's for a lack of faith. So, we talk about judgment. We name the show Judgment, in particular with respect to bishops and even many of the clergy, because it's one of those four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. When we talk about the church and how she seems to be in free fall, I mean, you know, we still have dioceses closing throughout the country. Um, you know, we just have scandal on many levels. There's financial scandals. There's poor catechesis. Poor evangelization, which is one of the things that's most sorely needed from Catholics in the Catholic Church. Okay, you have authentic good priests being persecuted, even bishops. But again, most importantly, you have a hierarchy that refuses to exercise its moral authority and responsibility to speak out relentlessly against the abortion holocaust. Okay, they're mostly silent. And so we raised the question, how did we get here? And I did that prelude when the show started, you know, kind of providing an outline of how we did get here, okay? Because we have, on many levels, you know, and it's been proven, a scandalous hierarchy because not that anything they've done or any of us, anything that any of us have done can't be forgiven, but they refuse to repent of their sins. And that's what I want to get at, the bulk of the show. And all indications seem to be that, you know, up to now, the behavior is not going to go away anytime soon. So we have to remember, as we talked about before, that God speaks to the faithful through what's happening in his holy church at large. So that's why we have to be aware of these things in order to, that we know what to pray for. Okay, so we have to be aware of what's happening in the church, but we can't allow ourselves to obsess over any scandal. Because, of course, Christ said, the jaws of hell shall never prevail against my bride, the Catholic Church. So despite our personal failings, the failings of the hierarchy, the church herself will never fall. So we can take great consolation in that. But that doesn't mean we sit back and we don't engage in the fight, which is my argument okay, 
against the bishops. They're not doing nearly enough. Our Lord predicted that scandal, scandals were inevitable. Okay, and we see him staring us in the face every day with, of course, abortion at the top of the list. Okay, so scandal in the church is inevitable. Okay, but most notably, the Holocaust of abortion. It should be an eye opener for us because every day, Jim, when we pray, you know, we invoke the Blessed Virgin Mary, we invoke Our Lady of Fatima, and she told us, if Fatima, if her words were not heeded, if men don't repent, entire nations would be destroyed, and not just physically, but most importantly, spiritually. And that's what we're seeing happening, even in our own great country, on so many levels, particularly with the attack on the family. Okay, so. The modern Catholic Church clings to more than anything the sin that she clings to, okay? So much so that we're willing to put up with all these ordained ministers afraid to boldly proclaim the truth with clarity, okay? And allow helpless and helpless of innocent children being ripped from their mother's wombs. Um, there's just, it's all because of rebellion, basically. Rebellion against the magisterium. So we talked about Roe v. Wade. But in particular, rebellion with respect to the church's constant teaching, you know, before that on artificial birth control, okay, which was outlined very clearly and dogmatically and infallibly in Humanae Vitae, which said that the church has always taught that artificial contraception is intrinsically evil without exception. It can never be used for the purpose of preventing conception. But we rebelled against that. And it wasn't just the laity, it was the clergy as well. And so no one speaks more with more authority than the man who speaks in the name of Jesus Christ himself. So when Paul VI taught Humanae Vitae as truth, it made it truth forever. If something is truth, it's always truth, okay? But we've refused to listen to our Lord. And so that's where we're at now. And it doesn't seem like we're repenting when we have the majority of quote-unquote Catholic women that believe that artificial conception is okay, contraception rather, okay? And so many Catholics, we've become, I mean, I guess the greater point is we've become, and not that's just one of the gravest examples, but there's so much evil staring us right in the face that we've become anesthetized to. We don't even recognize evil when it's staring us in the face. And this is one of the gravest one of them. One of them because it's led to what we see come to fruition right now is you know the abortion holocaust and then because of that other things that are so serious as well like we're talking about respect for what the holy eucharist is okay so what is inevitable is not the fact that god cannot forgive but the fact that he can't forgive the unrepentant so when we talk about this judgment I want to talk particularly about the judgment on impenitent bishops who double down, who don't apologize for their wrongdoings, or when they caught, they blame other people, and they, they just don't own up to it, okay? because they're not accountable to anybody. When scandals of abuse come out, they blame others, okay? And if it comes out on a priest, he's immediately taken out. There's a full investigation that's done, but that rarely happens with a bishop. So I use this example. In that talk I gave in the spiritual conference about, you know, and you mothers take heed to this because it's a very vivid imagery in this example about a mother. If you can picture in your head a mother who is condemned, if you will, to let fall with her own hand the knife of a guillotine that would chop the head off her very own son. Hey, think of that imagery, how horrible, how horrendous that is. Even so, after having considered that example, our Lord Jesus Christ will be forced one day to pronounce the sentence of eternal death on his poor, impenitent bishops who are obstinate to the end in refusing his pardon. Okay, and I say this because they're, as all of us are, in so much need of prayer. Okay, so the scripture tells us it's appointed that one day we shall all die, and after death comes what? Judgment. So they, the bishops, I mean, must appear before their creator, the God of majesty, clothed no longer in kindness and mercy, but in truth and justice, inexorable. 
So the sight of their angry judge will cast them into this unspeakable anguish. It's hard to even think about. And his glance of wrath will seem to them harder than a thousand hells. So again, we're in this spiritual warfare battle. The bishops have to render this account before his majesty of their whole lives. From the first instant of reason to their last voluntary act as successors of the apostles. So the judgment upon them, of course, will be just. It is Almighty God, the Supreme Judge, who will pronounce the sentence. It will be ratified by their own consciences. And of course, Satan will be there to accuse each and every one of them and to claim his prey. You know, you might hear him saying, Satan, saying to our Lord, I didn't die for them, and yet they serve me. It is just that the whole lot of them should be mine for all eternity. He'll accuse them. And souls lost by their fault, and there are millions of them, souls lost by their fault, will demand then a just vengeance. They'll say, those bishops taught us evil. They were silent when they needed to speak out. They refused, they refused to speak the truth boldly and clearly. They seduced us by their horrible example. They opened hell for us. It's only just that they should fall into the burning pit with us. Okay, and the reality is that their guardian angels, whom they, in many cases, so often despise, will be there. And they'll unveil their frightful sins committed in their holy presence, and each one of them will call for the bishop's merited chastisement. And so before the tribunal of mighty, Christ, mighty Jesus Christ, They'll be without excuse. They'll be without friends. They'll be without fellow bishops to cover for them. They'll be without defenders. This is how it'll be for all of us, of course. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, who, of course, wished to save every last one of them, has finally found herself powerless in the face of what? Their obstinacy has now forced to turn from all of them her maternal glance. All their friends on earth have now abandoned them, and they're ignorant of the lot reserved for them. Even their prayers can't save them any longer from God's almighty justice. And so our Lord Jesus Christ, who so often entreated them not to betray him, in the Eucharist, for example, will be found at the moment of judgment angry and no longer able to draw them to himself because of their obstinacy. So, we pray that it doesn't come to this. But what indication is there for somebody who lives a life obstinate all the way to the end will suddenly change? Miracles of God are, of course, always possible, but unlikely. But it would take a miracle of God. So what revelations are in store for that great day of accounting? Okay, So we have so much to pray for, even to sacrifice for. But remember, again, the root of the problem of bad bishops, I talked about how it's actually a chastisement, lies in a contraceptive laity. Okay? They're just a manifestation of this rebellion. So our Lord says nothing is hidden that won't be uncovered. So every evil thought, every wicked project, every sin of omission, all sacrileges, every infamy, every refusal to protect the helpless unborn, will be brought into the clear light of day. So it does matter what we do now. M very much so. And it matters what we omit. So, of course, during their lives here on earth, they seemed, you know, to be in the first rank of dignity, fiercely embracing the spirit of the world. Okay, but at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ, his strict justice will find the whole lot of them in the last and the least worthy of our Lord's people. If Our Lady's request was actually uh, granted, which was to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart, why are we seeing what we're seeing? So many of the things that Kurt mentioned, you know, this spread of communism that I'm addressing, um, you know, raise the question. 
it doesn't make sense, does it? But the reality is, you know, to answer the caller's question, we have to name the enemy. That's what we're doing here. And of course, ultimately, that's Satan, okay? And principalities and powers, as St. Paul tells us. But he's doing such a good job. That's my point here in, in this in this content is influencing people and how he does it and how clever he is and how diabolical and deliberate and rational and persistent he is, okay? And so this is something from all ages that he's conceived of, and we're just starting to see the fruition, and it may very well be, you know, many people believe firmly that this is the end times, um, may very well be. Um, but we definitely know the enemy, we definitely know how he influences and how, as, as Kurt alluded to, uh, he's influenced leaders within the church, and it goes right up to the top. Okay, this isn't conspiracy theory stuff. This is things that we have evidence of that we're trying to present here. So one of the things that struck me, you know, that I'm trying to say that the caller reiterated is the finality of these four last things. So heaven and hell, it's one or the other for all eternity. There's no going back. Judgment, okay, there's a finality to it. There is a point where God will no longer be able to be merciful, where one makes the rational decision and calculated conclusion to either reject or accept God. And my point is we're seeing all this evidence of just the opposite of that, even in the hierarchy. So my deeper point is that Satan is doing his job. Okay. Okay. He's got his grips. And so we want to talk about the reality of this judgment on those in the highest ranks in the church, but also for our own benefit, because we all undergo the same kind of judgment. We'll be faced at Judgment Day with the reality of every one of our sins, and we'll be accountable for all of them. You know, to continue to talk about the reality of, you know, how this judgment will go. So I was talking about, you know, the apostolic life of the bishops, and they're put on this pedestal, right? Okay. So not every last one of them, but many of them, okay, aren't genuine. And this may come across as harsh, but better to hear it now than on the day of judgment. So we want our leaders to be men that we can follow, but for many of us, they are not. Okay, so I'm talking about the lives of bishops in particular, because there are many that have been unproductive and even evil, okay? Okay where they've actually uselessly occupied space, like the scripture says, like a withered tree. So our Lord, who is the just judge that he is, he'll cut down that tree. He'll cast it into the depths of hell where it will be burned. And on that day, they'll hear the fatal sentence of our Lord, depart from me, thou cursed it into everlasting fire. So imagine a bishop burned in hell. Okay, they've driven almighty God from their hearts during this life. And now God in his turn will drive them far from himself. So here on earth, they prefer to live without their redeemer. They prefer to seek out and embrace human respect, which is one of the gravest sins we commit, especially as a cleric, worrying about what the world thinks. Okay, they've relentlessly given our Lord Jesus Christ the Judas kiss by handing him over to those in obstinate mortal sin. And thus they shall be internally banished from the presence of Almighty God, their maker, and pursued eternally by his just anger. So we can think about many cases of actually pathetic and effeminate and emasculated lives here on earth that they've embraced. They've refused heaven, the happiness which our Savior offered them. So they'll thus groan forever in the abyss, the reality of hell and unhappiness, where there reigns neither order nor harmony nor love but rather eternal horror and unbounded hate. That's the reality of hell. So they've made ill use of the time God gave them as successors of the apostles, many of them, as a body, certainly. And now time will be no more for the lot of them on Judgment Day. So think about how now so many of them, they wear their miters upon their heads so proudly. Okay, they carry their croziers so everybody can see them. But they never actually think of stirring up the Kurds to actually beat back the ravenous wolves constantly attacking and infiltrating the sheepfold on their watch. 
So instead, they put away from themselves the thought of eternity now. But now on judgment day, it'll cling to them like a garment. It will envelop them as this boundless ocean. And they'll remain there fixed as a stone thrown into the ocean. Think of that imagery. So think about just like the original 12 apostles. Today's the feast of St. Bartholomew in the old rite. The gospel is how Jesus handpicked each of them. Think of that. They were all handpicked and made to love their God. But in the depths of hell, they'll do nothing but hate. They'll hate the God who created them. They'll hate him with an inextinguishable hate. And that hatred will gnaw at them. It will be their eternal torment. And they'll hate their Redeemer, who'd chosen them to be his beloved bishops, just as he called Matthew down from the tree. He'll hate all his favors and all the sufferings that our Lord endured for them, the bishops will. So the sad thing is that they'll even hate the Immaculate Mother of God, his angels, his saints, their neighbors and friends of a former time of this life. But they'll especially hate themselves and all the damned on every side and all the demons of hell. And the damned and the demons will return that hate and they'll trample these lost bishops underfoot. They'll torture them, they'll pour out on them the hatred that they bore to Jesus Christ. So if you think about that apostolic character as bishops, it remains forever. A condemned bishop, their shame and punishment, world without end. We talked about eternity, we can't even grasp it. So our Lord Jesus Christ says, why do you force me to curse you? I died for you in a sea of anguish and an ocean of suffering. He wants them to return. And now is the time to return to his sacred heart. Because even if any of them sinned, for example, like Cain or Judas, our Lord is always still ready to offer pardon, to spare them and all of us the pains of hell. And the most important thing to remember is Blessed Virgin Mary in heaven has interceded for all of them, and she continues to do so as she does for all of us. She still holds back the arms of justice of Jesus Christ. And she promises that to our Lord that they will sincerely return to him. And so now is the time that we do have to pray and sacrifice. Okay? Um, and it's very important. Don't think that one's prayers don't matter. Uh, or the small sacrifices that we make, not just for our own sins, but for our leaders whom we want to follow, but who so often make it so difficult, you know? And in the couple minutes that we might have, I just want to focus, you know, on a very positive note about the reality of the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary, who's the queen of priests, the queen of bishops, because she's the mother of Jesus Christ, of, of course, and she is every priest's mother, every bishop's mother, because our Lord has chosen her not only for him, but for us. He gave her grace. He gave her purity. He gave her all the gifts that a mere creature could possibly have that we don't have. And so our Lord from God received the fullness of the priesthood when he was made incarnate in the womb of Mary in her all pure womb. And in that obedience, okay, to God the Father, he also, to his priests, although infinitely unworthy, or his bishops, we were all con also conceived as a priest or a bishop in that time. Okay, So that notion of being chosen from all eternity, and so that's why it's such a horror to think about, you know, a priestly soul or an ordained soul that doesn't make it to heaven, or any soul for that matter, because God didn't create us to damn us, of course. He wants our salvation, but, you know, we have to work it out with fear and trembling, and no saint ever made it to heaven without humility, without sa sacrificing and suffering. And we just wonder, you know, if our leaders are doing nearly enough, if at all, any of that. Okay, for the Catholic Church at large, for themselves, and for us, their flock. So we always have the Blessed Virgin Mary who constantly exists simply to intercede for us, to bring us to Christ, to keep us close to him. 
That's why it's so important that we foster this genuine devotion, especially as priests, and sincere devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Okay? And if we do and have that, we cannot be led astray. And I guarantee you, you know, the mention was made of a particular priest twi twisting scripture early in the show. That priest in no way can have a true devotion to Mary because one who does could never teach scripture in an inerrant way. Okay? But that's what we see happening on so many fronts. So our Lord loved and still loves his mother actually more than all the creatures he created put together. But he wants his priests especially, his other selves, to love her even as he has loved her. And so that's our challenge. And when we can do that, and we can sincerely do that, we can almost rest assured our salvation, Jim, which is what we want for all of us.